states, the local governments, that's where you find, that's where you experience climate change, that's where you experience inequalities, that's where you see declining livelihoods, that's where you see, you know, it's a fragile state system, uh, conflicts. It's really unfortunate what happened in Borno uh, yesterday. Uh, sympathies to our colleague governor in Borno State and the people of Borno. It's in the States you find human trafficking, you find all the humanitarian crisis we talk about. So we governors have have to deal with that, those challenges on a daily basis. And so, so for us, the SDG cannot and should not just be another global concept. It must be a concept we own. It has to be part of our planning process. It has to be part of our agenda setting for our people. And that's what the NGF is about. That's what we, you know, we do at our National Economic Council meetings on a monthly basis, where we look at those key issues that the, um, the SDGs are focused on. So specifically, we've, we, we're, while not looking at, you know, talking about the numbers, about the SDG, what, you know, in, in terms of their numbers, but the concepts are all are embroiled in our planning process. Okay. Honorable well, Minister, uh, let's look at the perspective of, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the domain of uh, uh, climate change, for instance, you hear so much about nationally determined goals in mitigating climate change. Taking it to SDGs now, being at the planning hub in Nigeria, what are the funding gaps and how do you lace this with uh, domestic resources aligned to achieve more skills? Well, to start with, when we did the current national plan that we're implementing, the ERGP, we made sure that the SDGs were mainstreamed within the plan. As a matter of fact, when we completed the plan, we gave it to an external group and said, can you just run an SDG compliance test? And we had provided for in several uh, provisions, in several of the goals and targets, the 17 SDG goals. So as we implement our plans, we're also implementing and working towards achieving the, the SDGs. The SDGs has given us an, an added opportunity that the MDGs did not have of being able to uh, use a whole government approach, being able to uh, have the plan owned by by the citizens themselves. We've been able to put in place not just a process that is continuously linked with the subnationals, the states. We also have a private sector advisory group. We have a civil society group. And then we have several teams of youths that are interested in and actively working in the SDGs. Now, every year within the NYSC, there is there are group pockets of groups of youths of, of coppers that are working on this so there's ownership there's national ownership it's not the federal government program it's not the state program even in the design of some of the uh, programs we're implementing um, we have some programs where there's counterpart uh, funding contribution on a 50 50 basis for education, for health between the states and the and the federal government. So we're seeing progress being made and uh, we're hopeful that we will largely be able to achieve the SDGs. We're starting a new process for a new national development plan. Mm -hmm. We also are developing the various thematic areas and we keep asking ourselves, uh, are we meeting all of the SDG goals in several of the thematic areas? Well, by the UN Deputy Secretary General said, Key to these is uh, inequality, poverty, security. I'm not even talking about education and health. How focused are they? Well, let me start from peace. Peace is important for the attainment of any national ob objective, any global objective. And so it's very important that we should attain peace. In, 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 uh, uh, the commitments that the president made. He committed to ensuring peace and security 
of Nigeria because that's the first thing. Without peace and security, you can't even be able to attain your your economic objectives. But having made some progress in that, we're concentrating on growing the economy, but growing the economy in a manner that is inclusive and sustainable. The president a year ago had made a commitment to Nigerians that we're going to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty over a period of 10 years. So as ministers, we have clear KPIs. Every ministry has key performance indicators that must attain. And we're being continuously asked, what is your contribution towards lifting Nigerians out of poverty? So from the, from the perspective of means of finance, budget, and national planning, uh, I'll just give you an example. We, re we recently had this finance bill 2019 that has been enacted into law. And while we were doing the bill, the target for us was to, as much as possible, provide relief for very small businesses so that those businesses can grow, they can employ people, and thereby pulling Nigerians out of poverty. We, went, we took the pains of zeroing taxes for them. So if you're a small business, that has turnover of 25 million and below, you pay zero taxes. And medium-sized businesses that have turnover of 25 million to 100 million, we reduce the tax, uh, company income tax from 30% to 20%. Our belief is that that will help Nigerians to, uh, that will encourage entrepreneurship and, and therefore improve livelihood, improve employment, and in the process we're pulling Nigerians out of poverty. Prof, pace of progress quite illuminating there. Would you say it is sufficient towards achieving this huge ambition? Uh, my suspicion is that the pace is never enough. But is that the issue? The issue for me really is that these goals are so important for our future. They are so important for building a world in which you do the greatest good to the greatest number. So at each point, your responsibility, your duty, is to do as much as you can with the resources available and within, within the context of the challenges we face. And we do face challenges in this uh, country. One is the security challenge, which takes a lot of resources from other work that needs to be done. Uh, while trying to confront that challenge and change the situation, you are faced with this limitation of uh, resources. So I would not say that uh, the pace is as high as I would want it to be, but then I'm too much of a realist to uh, disregard the facts on the mm -hmm. table and think you can move on at a fast pace whatever conditions you find yourselves in. Okay, now the SGT is launched in progress and 10 years is a countdown already. <coughs> yes. So we ask, did, you, did, you, did the UN just throw it out there and walked away, left the countries, left the regions to just walk with it? What's the UN doing to assist achieving this ambition nationally, regionally? Well, no, of course not. It took four years to frame them, and I think it was the greatest engagement that we had. Over five years, what we can see is there has been engagement. Every country is using the framework one way or another. With the UN, what we did in the last four years was, um, in fact, to look at how we can be more fit for purpose to support and accompany countries to do this, because it is more complex. It is a different paradigm shift for um, development, where as we say, we're doing the whole of it. We will look at the economy and to see what are you needing to do to drive it, to make it more inclusive. Um, and so that's something that we do um, with our country teams, with um, uh, resident coordinators today who are more independent and able to handle the assets and the footprint of the UN to support partnerships, to support governments in health and education, humanitarian, but even peacekeeping. Um, and we know that this region faces additional challenges um, and as the Honourable Minister has said, without peace we can't have development or can we then achieve the, the human rights that we, you know, each and every one of us aspires to and has a, has a right to. Um, 
and, and so that's part of it. We, we use the international forum to convene to see what we can do to try to keep the peace, to try to solve the conflicts. Um, and I have to say that that perhaps is when we talk to the scale um, and the speed at which we need to do these things um, is not commensurate with the demands and the response that's needed by citizens in countries across this region and around the world. So if we talk about Boko Haram um, and the, the, the terrorism in the Sahel, for instance, this is a huge burden on this country. Um, it's not just about what happens within our borders, it's also what happens across our borders. That's removed from the, the possibilities of what you can spend um, in your domestic resources um, on development. So for us, it's about going back again to the Security Council, to the international community, to, to impress upon them, resolve issues in Libya, resolve some of the issues that um, we know uh, come from different parts of the world to exacerbate our situation. The other is to put pressure on climate change. Um, where are the actors that um, need to take actions to reduce um, the emissions so that we also have a, a chance to develop at the pace at which we need to, um, uh, realizing that the greatest burden of climate change is on states like uh, Nigeria. So it's accompanying really states to try to achieve the, the SDGs. Okay. One of the questions we asked at the opening of the program, we said, what lessons to learn from Nigeria. We have reports mm -hmm. in the landscape of Nigeria. Our first shot is Lagos. Let's take a listen. Alimosho General Hospital in Gondu, Lagos State, is one of the SDG intervention projects. The maternal and child care center is a 140 bed health facility inaugurated in October 2019. With state-of-the-art facilities to boost health care delivery, this project has brought succor to the people of Igondu and Ikontu, as well as other neighboring communities. Lydia Uluwashiung, a teacher, says the new facility has reduced congestion and created a conducive environment for patients and medical practitioners. When it comes to this side where we have the children, there's more attention. When you take care of the mother and the child, you are obviously taking care of the family. And the family unit is very relevant to any society. The Lagos State Government has also stepped up its efforts to improve healthcare delivery across the state through a remarkable improvement in the allocation of funds to the health sector. In our prevention strategy, we're building a more robust health infrastructure, primary health care, so that we can achieve the universal health coverage. In the area of education, the ECO Excel initiative has now empowered all public primary school teachers with modern tools to deliver qualitative education. The new method is a computerized method. So in the first instance, it makes all teachers, including the head teachers, computer literate. The recent launch of the E for She campaign to promote gender parity, the empowerment of women and youths through various programs are indications of the state government's efforts towards achieving some of the sustainable development goals. However, for these development experts, they are of the view that the desired results cannot be achieved without the involvement of relevant stakeholders. In the next 10 years, 10 years is like yesterday. We need to run. We don't have time. And the more we put more effort, the more we achieve. The development experts also advocate the need for substantial effort on the part of the government and other stakeholders towards the attainment of other aspects of the sustainable development goals. In Lagos, Paul Mukago. In sustaining the conversation, our next stop is Kaduna. Provision of quality education is the goal number four of Sustainable Development Goals and Kaduna State has gone far in achieving it. The Eurofire administration is committed toward improving the education sector, which led to the increase in school enrollment by 90.9% in two years. The enrollment has increased from 1.1 million to 2.1 million between 2017 and 2019. The state government has also spent huge resources in training teachers and providing infrastructure in schools. It is our intention in Kaduna State Government to ensure that all our public schools offer quality education and we are encouraging all our senior public servants to have their children in public schools. Under our Conditional Grant Scheme 2019 project, we are doing our interventions in two sectors the education sector and the health sector. 
we have awarded contracts about 191 projects in all the 23 local government areas. As part of efforts to promote quality healthcare delivery, the state government has renovated 255 primary healthcare centers, while Contributory Health Management Authority has been established to ensure universal health coverage. On infrastructure, many roads are under construction in Kaduna Metropolis and beyond, in addition to housing development. If you don't have infrastructure, uh, you, you don't think of delivering quality education, you do not think of delivering quality health care, agriculture, no better life and welfare for the people. Uh, even the investment in businesses and commerce and manufacturing industry cannot take place. To put the state on sustainable economic growth, the state government created windows for job creation through private sector investment with more industries springing up across the state. Completion of the new Zaria water treatment plant, stakeholders say, is an indication of the state government commitment toward providing water and sanitation across the state. With this development, the projection is that Kaduna State will be a role model in achieving sustainable development goals, not only in northern Nigeria, but in the entire country. In Kaduna, Ahmad Umar Kudang. From southeast Nigeria, let's take a listen from this report from Enugu. One of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, Enugu State has been its search light on poverty alleviation, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, to mention a few. The projects embarked upon as a core mandate of the Office of the Enugu State Commissioner for Special Duties and Focal Person SDGs are as itemized by the Commissioner Mabel Abo. The latest was done in the year 2017 and it was based on construction of teachers' quarters and water system toilets for various schools. On go one, we have done a scale acquisition and poverty by involving unemployed youths into scale acquisition and empowering them at the end of their training. Respondents, however, highlighted other areas of life in the state that require urgent attention if the sustainable development goals must be realized in the year 2030. I want the government to improve on our electricity and infrastructure-wise and um, help the small-scale business because this electricity is affecting the small-scale business. The Sustainable Development Goals, a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all, is yet to be deeply rooted in Enugu State. Respondents, however, advocate synergy between government, private sector and civil society organizations in order to achieve global, regional, national and local results. In Enugu, Mena Adobe Kobasi. Decade of action to deliver on global goals. And if you can be part of the conversation, our phone lines are open. You can put your calls through our Twitter handle at Tuesday Live NTA. You can send in your tweets. Now, the Honorable Minister said this thing is not all about government, it's about a college of public private sector. And when you hear these various tones of music is played. So Looking at the fact that the decade of action will require mobilizing everyone everywhere, demand urgency and ambition at the state level. How is everybody carried so that, because if everybody is involved and understand, carrying and understanding, then implementation will be seamless. Where are we with this? Um, we, we can look at implementation from two perspectives. Um, first, from a, a cooperation standpoint, that is a relationship between the federal government and the state governments, and then between the state governments and the various actors within the state borders. Um, in terms of the relationship between the federal and state governments, uh, we've had, the NGF has enjoyed very robust working relationships. Um, in the areas of education, for instance, we uh, have worked very closely with the federal government. We want to thank the, uh, President Buhari, who insisted 
that the last tranche of the Paris Club refunds should be spent as counterpart funds to those states that hadn't contributed their counterpart funds for um, basic education. Um, that puts quite a lot of resources in the hands of many states to you know, roll out the reforms which they needed to in the area of basic education. In the area of healthcare, there's also very robust cooperation with the Federal Ministry of Health and other federal agencies. Um, most states have um, signed up to the primary healthcare, universal mm -hmm. primary healthcare uh, schemes. They, you know, working on the health insurance arrangements so that more people can have access to basic um, um, healthcare. Within the states themselves, you know, like I said, different states have um, taken ownership of their of the, uh, their, their development uh, agenda and have incorporated the SDGs as part of their you know, planning processes. If I speak of Edo State and a few other states for, you know, to be specific, we find out that you know, we have like a six pillar agenda uh, where we focus on social development, yeah. with, you know, institutional ar arrangements, because governments have to work, the institutions have to be there mm -hmm. for us to implement these, these SDGs. Uh, before you now look at the other, you know, key issues of the environment, you know, it's one area a lot of us have not emphasized, and people forget that part of the security challenges we're having today, particularly uh, in the Northeast, is as a result of climate change. Um, you know, so, so internally, as part of the planning process, many states are looking at, you know, the issues first at a federal state collaboration uh, phase, and then, you know, internally within uh, the states and local governments, trying to make sure that the resources at the local government uh, level are also directed to, you know, and uh, focused on dealing with the, some of the challenges which SDGs are supposed to, you know, to, to, to focus on. Okay. Our first class tonight on the program is calling from Kano, Abubakar Ibrahim. Hello, Abubakar. Hello. Hello, Abu Bakr, you're on to Tuesday Live today. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good evening. Hello, my name is Abu Bakr Jibrahim. I'm calling from Kano State. Go ahead. I would like to know if we have any impact or we have seen any impact. Good afternoon. Just go ahead, we can hear you. Good afternoon, my name is Abu Bakr Ibrahim. I would like to ask if we have any impact of SDGs or if you have seen of SDGs in Kano State. Okay, thank you. We are okay. Thank you, Obaka. I think he has just thrown one question. I don't know that you want to uh, respond to that. I, uh, if I heard him clearly, he was asking if, if there's, there's any, any impact of the impact SDGs of the SDGs in Kano State. Yes. Well, uh, let me speak on from the point of view of the federal government. The federal government is currently has started implementing the National Social Investment Program since 2016, and Kano State has one of the largest number of beneficiaries. Kano State has all of the clusters, so the Homegrown School Feeding Program is there, the Empower Program is there. In fact, I think the largest number of uh, students that have been fed under the Homegrown School Feeding Program is from Kano State. We have the Empower uh, beneficiaries in Kano. We also have a significant number of um, persons that are receiving this monthly conditional cash transfer of 5,000 Naira and also a good number of beneficiaries under the Government Enterprise Empowerment Program, the JEEP, as well as the Trader Money. So because of the sheer size of the population in Kano, um, it has the largest share of beneficiaries in the National Social Investment Program and the Social Investment Program is addressing several of the SDG goals. So you can say that by, by implication that 
the SDGs is well on its way to being implemented, at least the contribution of the federal government. But I've also been to Kano and I've seen the kind of uh, very good infrastructure that has been roll, rolled out by the state government, uh, very good roads, bridges. But I also had an opportunity of going for the commissioning of two major hospitals. One is a pediatric center and another one that was called uh, President Mohammed Buhari Hospital, like a general hospital. Very well equipped, modern hospital. Um, the school also has done renovation of a lot of schools and has made a significant regulation that I think is new. I think there, there's Kano, Kaduna, and Edo that have done this taste to domesticate the health insurance uh, program. So that that is all addressing uh, several of the goals of the SDGs in Kano. Okay. Well, still on you, Honorable Minister, very critical to this is given the fact that one of the concerns the, that we saw with MDGs was the issue of set targets. Now, for SDG, we have set targets. So, what M and E do you have in place to ensure that timelines are met towards attaining these set targets? So, learning from the MDGs, the very first point of call for us was uh, developing a baseline, and that was done. Uh, by the National Bureau of Statistics and the SDG office. So because we have baselines, we are now able to monitor what has been achieved on an annual basis. And the reports are showing that uh, there, there's progress being made. The movement is a positive, uh, is a positive one. Um, I, I think also in 2020, there's another report that is going to be made. And then it will be like, uh, we didn't start, so we didn't start 10 years ago. So it will be like a mid-term uh, mid report of the SDGs uh, that we'll be doing in 2020. You know, one thing about certain targets, if you don't apply some mild sanctions of, or incentives, people will not jack up. I, I, do you have plans to maybe apply incentives to make it somehow competitive? Well, so maybe, earlier when I gave you an example yes. of the counterpart funding scheme, that's an incentive, and okay. it's saying federal government has resources on the table, but the states have to match those funds. So it's been done for quite a number of projects that are implemented by the SDG office, but also in the basic health care provision fund. Uh, we made sure that the provision has an incentive for the states to also provide some contribution before they can access the funding that is available. Let's take this caller from Port Harcourt, Mustafa. Hello, Mustafa. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Mustafa. Go ahead, please. You're onto the program. Hello? We can, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I call in respect of uh, the Empower program that the Honorable Minister just said now. Hello? We can hear you. Go ahead, Mustafa. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. We Hello? Can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. It looks we have lost that caller there. Well, let me go to Professor Jibril before I take the tweets. Now, key to SDGs, one regular song in the mouth of Nigeria at the federal, state, local government has been the issue of climate change. And key to this is recharging the lake chart basin. And if this is done, economic activities, migrational issues will be addressed. What's your take on this? Well, the Lake Chad uh, crisis is a serious one. As we know, 40 million people are dependent on Lake Chad for their uh, livelihoods. So this is something that you cannot uh, abandon. It's not an accident that the insurgency uh, we have uh, been suffering for the past decade arose uh, in that zone. I recall in our younger days there were huge agricultural projects for wheat and rice production in the Lake Chad uh, region, but 
the drying up of the lake has caused a major difficulty in terms of people's livelihoods. The recharging of the lake is a big issue. Uh, I know that uh, the plan has been to take water from the Ubangi River in Central African Republic and channel it to Lake Chad. Uh, the Central African Republic is in serious security crisis and has been, and the state in that country controls only 30% of its territory. So it's a project that's important, but may not be very uh, immediate. There are also competition. Uh, South Africa wants Ubangi River to be dammed to produce electricity. My sense about the Lake Chad uh, recharging issue is what can we do ourselves to improve the situation? We know, for example, that my state, Kano State, has dammed the Chalawa River that takes water to Lake Chad. What can we do to ensure that some of that water is released? And how do we improve interstate relations so that you don't have one state taking decisions that can adversely affect other states without making sure everybody is carried along? The issue, therefore, of Lake Chad is that the two sources from Nigeria, we have to really work on it. Uh, the other is uh, in a country through Gombe, which is also uh, dammed. But I think there are also micro issues that need to be addressed. There's a lot of local variation. There are still parts of Lake Chad that are vi viable. How do you ensure you bring security as quickly as possible so that fishing can continue where uh, there is water and farming can continue around the existing water sources. There is therefore a lot in terms of micro-planning at the state and local government that could lead to a significant improvement of the lives of the 40 million people that live around there. Okay, let's take this caller from Worry, Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. It looks Gabriel is not ready. Well, Hello. Yeah, I, I can't hear you very well, but I hope uh, you can hear me. Can uh, hear you. Go ahead, my question please. is this. Go ahead, go ahead. My question is this. Um, a lot has been said about uh, entrepreneurship for unemployed youths, but there are also graduates who have left uh, school for quite a number of years now who might not be actually... Uh, having the ability to go into business. Not everybody's caught up of business. So what what is the SDG's role in making sure some of these students or researchers, as it were, some of them, can, you know, make use of their research to properly develop or make a meaningful contribution to the Nigerian society. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Let me leave that. It's an open question. Yeah, it is an open question. I just wanted to add to the question you also put for uh, Professor Jibril. The, uh, the Lake Chad piece, there's also a lot of water bodies that need better maintenance. If you go to Yobe State, you'll find many of them that are overtaken with typhoid grass. When we were in environment, we were able to remove that, and those water bodies actually released a phenomenal amount of water uh, for farming to then, you know, uh, augment what uh, has been lost. Um, that are um, of their own lives as well. That's important. I think the social investment program has done quite a bit to try to, yeah. to look at that. Uh, but perhaps going back to what His Excellency had said, it really is also um, in the states that we are going to be looking to empower young people yeah. um, and, and local governments. Let's not leave the local governments behind because this is where really uh, young people are. Um, you talk about the Northeast. If we speak to climate change, these are, even the conflict, these are all exacerbated by climate change. But the root causes have been an inability for justice and inclusion and equality to thrive. 
for people to get basic services from local governments, from states, um, and therefore hopeless and become easy fodder for those who want to um, engage in destabilizing um, uh, regions like uh, like the Northeast. So. It is important um, in everything that we do to see how do we bring back our youth um, into the mainstream of our econo economic growth. Okay, before I take I mean, the next topic, let me ask Excellency, yeah. do you have a case study in your state oh. linked with the question that was just asked? Oh, certainly. Um, we, we have what we call Edo Jobs, which is mm -hmm. uh, we started as a portal where we encourage young people, well, young and not young people, to register and got people, we have about 200,000 people who have registered on that portal, which therefore means that as a government we have visibility on 200,000 people who we know are actively searching for jobs. And so what we've done in the case of Edo Jobs is to undertake several, you know, several initiatives. One involves job matching, like uh, the, uh, like, I mean, I said, you know, you, you want to first identify the jobs people are suited for and you want to train and prepare them for those jobs. Uh, we also uh, you know want to also emphasize entrepreneurship you know to training them and relating them to various opportunities. What we've done is to look at areas that the jobs have been created. Areas like technology, areas like agriculture and try to steer a lot of these young you know people in that direction you know to take an interest and we've made sure that we've continued to emphasize on training we have three specific initiatives we have the innovation hub um, the, which was launched by the vice president where which houses a lot of technology companies where young people just train on a daily basis to look for opportunities we have companies like facebook google you know cisco you know all sitting in, you know, in that location, offering training, offering support to young, uh, young people, young business people who are in search of, who have ideas and they want to express. We also have, have what we call a production hub, where we look for locations and show with creative, you put in facilities, amenities like. 24-7 electricity, um, water security, and encourage young entrepreneurs to go and locate there and produce. Um, we have two of them you know, running, and it's been very, very successful. In fact, after we launched the first hub, we had almost 200 small businesses on a waiting list, you know, you know seeking for such opportunities. Okay, governance is key to all this. If all these programs are put in place and the governance process is not mm -hmm. properly mainstreamed, what happens? Well, you cannot perform if you do not govern correctly, if you are not able to develop policies that achieve the objectives you've set for yourself, and if you are not able to ensure that resources are generated and affected to specific projects and activities that will deliver the results you are seeking. So for me, uh, governance is extremely important. And we've had a long history in this country of serious challenges to governance. One of the most serious has been, of course, the issue of public corruption. Uh, we do have a government that's committed to combating uh, corruption, but as no Rivado used to say, when you fight corruption, corruption fights, fights you back. So we, I think this government realizes it's not as easy as they thought uh, initially. But what's important is that significant efforts are being carried out uh, in that uh, direction. Because once you are able to ensure public resources are used for the public good, you are, by definition, improving your governance capacity. And that's why that's uh, particularly important. The other issue is really the question of competence. Our educational institutions have been declining uh, over time. I've been a teacher for 40 years, so I know that. And uh, the skill sets that we are delivering in our schools 
are not the best to generate the levels of productivity that we need to have in our society. So how can we use improved governance to make sure the training our children receive in our schools are improved uh, significantly so that that improved training and skills would contribute positively to achieving these goals we have set for ourselves. Okay, well, let's take this caller from Kano, Tasio. Hello, Tasio. Hello, Tasio. Go ahead, Tasio. Well, Hello, good evening. Good evening, Tasio. Go ahead, please. Hello, good evening. Hear you. Go ahead, go ahead. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is Tasio Musa calling from Kano. Please, my question goes to Haji Amina directly. Go ahead. Yes, I want to know if there is any funding from... I want to know if there is any funding directly from the United Nations directly to the burial states on supporting these SDGs, or was it purposely designed for the president or president or the state governors to like uh, uh, implement and support this uh, program directly? So that is my question. Thank you, Tasu. That's a great question. I mean, the international framework provides um, some form uh, of a, a frame of these different goals that have to be had, but it's a sovereign, it's a state responsibility. How do you grow your economies? What the UN does is to try to convene to leverage the resources that could come in investments to, to countries like Nigeria. So, yes, there are opportunities. Uh, we can look at all the health funds that are available for which Nigeria benefits from um, to specific states. And the Global Fund is one and it provides for a number of vaccines and programs over the years. It's been scaled up for the SDGs. Uh, we also see funding now coming for sustainable energy. Um, and that also is uh, around the sustainable energy uh, for all. Um, uh, initiative that we have that also provides uh, resources here. The Green Climate Fund is another um, opportunity that Nigeria is benefiting from. Um, uh, so yes, there are various resources that um, the UN has that uh, are uh, accessible to countries like Nigeria. Okay. Before we go on break and take other specific questions, let's take a couple of tweets that have come in here and uh, who, like I told you, as much as time allows, we'll take all Otherwise, we take as this last we can within the time space of the program. First year is Nadom Wuye. Nigeria is indeed blessed with intellectuals. How be it prompt action is the challenge. God bless Nigeria. Next Amen. one says, Good evening. I thank honorables in the studio. Very important program going on. Please, honorable minister, help us to address the issue of delays in and power volunteer stipend, which has been a real occurrence every month. General stipend has not been paid. That's a tweet coming from Good Son of Godfather. That is the name of the Twitter handle. The next one is Farouk. It takes time to plan a successful program. However, there has been series of discontinuity in program implementation by successive administrations, for example, you win and jeep. Will that not affect the speed in achieving SDGs? Dao So says, Good evening, please. My question is to the minister. Why is it that NPAS stipends don't get paid on time? Today's date is 11, but yet no payment. Thank you. Maybe you respond to that, please. Okay. Um, I can say that uh, from the point of view of Ministry of Finance, we have released funding for NPOWER. The ministry that is responsible for paying NPOWER is, should be in the process of uh, effecting those payments. Okay. I believe your Twitter is addressed now. The, the very last few on this segment is, uh, can one really say that SDGs has achieved its major set objectives, which, eradicate, which is eradication of poverty, considering the fact that Nigeria has become the poverty capital of the world, having more than 100 million people living in abject poverty. Key question. Let me tell you the governor. 
uh, yeah, it's work in progress, SDGs like is work in progress. Um, what is significant is that particularly in the second term of Mr. President, we have seen renewed action, we've seen renewed vigor in pursuing those policies that will help grow the economy. You know, particularly in the areas of agriculture. We're seeing more investments going into agriculture, we're seeing more activities uh, um, in, in, you know, in agricultural produ production, we're seeing increase in food sufficiency, uh, we're seeing more investments going into education, into healthcare. Uh, with time, you know, you will begin to see significant improvements in livelihoods, you begin to see significant improvements in education and the quality of education and in healthcare. All of this can't happen overnight because the process that led us to where we, were, where we are now did not happen overnight. So there is progress being made, investments are being made. Yes, we still have execution capacity. We could, you know, we could run much faster. Uh, but all those um, bottlenecks have been identified. And with, you know, being in this program is one of them, just talking about okay. the issues. Okay. Sorry. Can I just okay. say something? Yes. We took stock of where we were with the SDGs in September last year, and what was clear across the globe, um, a lot of engagement, a lot of efforts being made, but insufficient for us to attain the SDGs. It's the reason why we have the call for the decade of action. So we need to accelerate um, uh, at a far greater speed and scale if we're to get there. And each year we have to put the pressure on each and every one of these countries uh, that are signed up um, to, to ask, so how far have you got? I think that helps countries because they are reminded. But one of the challenges that we will have, and we're not able to answer that um, or respond to citizens as we should, is baseline data. Disaggregated baseline data that actually tells where, if we want to leave no one behind, where are the no one